Next up on Extraordinary Faith, a show which presents the extraordinary richness of Catholic liturgy, art, and music, we'll visit Boston's St. Paul's Choir School, along with the Ladies Who Lead, Harvard University's Latin Mass Group. We'll introduce you to a young musical prodigy who composes for the pipe organ, and we'll show you the first solemn high Tridentine Mass offered at Harvard in over four decades. All this and more on Extraordinary Faith. Began. And I'm Mary O'Regan, and we'd like to welcome you to Extraordinary Faith, a program where we explore art, architecture, music, and people who celebrate in the classic forms of traditional Catholicism. We're coming to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Boston, home of Harvard University, my alma mater. I have a small link to Harvard, too, in that Love Story, a novel that influenced me greatly, was set here. We're here for an important occasion as one of America's most important Catholic musical institutions, the Boston Boys Choir at St. Paul's Church will be singing their very first mass in the extraordinary form. The grand tradition of the Catholic Boys Choir is well known. Who hasn't heard of the Vienna Boys Choir? Here in America, the most renowned place for training young men to sing is St. Paul's Choir School right here in Boston. They have issued numerous recordings and published a hymnal. Today, we're meeting up with the choir's director, John Robinson. John, welcome. Why don't we start off and have you give us a brief history of the choir school? The choir school was founded in 1963 which is 50 years ago this year, so we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. And it was founded by Dr. Theodore Marier uh, with the support of Father Hickey, who was the pastor at the time, um, and in response to a papal encyclical called De Musica Sacra, which was sent out in 1958 by uh, Pope Pius XII. Why did Ted Marier promote Latin and Gregorian chant in the years after Vatican II? He was a scholar and he understood the importance of Latin and Gregorian chant to the whole history of music, especially to Catholic music. He was working here at St. Paul's at a fairly, I suppose, volatile time in terms of church history in that Latin had sort of disappeared overnight and everybody was thinking everything, everything had to be in English. And he was not afraid to still do some things in Latin as well. Um, and he, it was, I think, proved by him really that that was so important to maintaining identity here at St. Paul's, but also to founding and running a choir school. You graduated from Cambridge University in England. How did you end up here in Boston? Really several reali realizations occurred. Firstly, I wanted to convert to become a Catholic. Um, and also I wanted to be directing and in charge of a music program and not always the person um, playing. Does it ever happen that the boys graduate to the men's choir as their voices change? Yes, it does. We, they take a while to settle down in their new voices and to find the new voices. So they wouldn't join the men's choir before the ninth grade, actually, when they've left the choir school. Um, they would, we would audition them and we would listen to how the voice was developing. We're talking about a big uh, transition in pitch here from the, you know, the trebles that sound like la, 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 la down to the basses who are going to sound like la 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 so it's a big it's a big leap from down to la at the bottom and they are moving from one to the other tell us how the hymnal at the parish came about we have this hymnal at the parish thanks to dr theodore marier who edited the hymnal himself in 1983 uh, and the hymnal came, I think, at no small personal cost to Dr. Marier. He indeed had to, I understand it, remortgage his house in order to finance the engraving of this hymnal. Um, and at the time he made it, this was absolutely a uh, unique, groundbreaking Catholic hymnal. Um, for its scholarship and for its knowledge of the tradition and for 
it's use, the way that it incorporates a complete parish music programme into one volume, is it's not just hymns here, it's also uh, settings of the Mass and uh, psalmody as well. Has the choir made any recordings? Yes, from Theodore Mario's time onwards, there was a recording in 1967, I think was the first, and he made six LPs which have not been available for a long time. So we've just recently re-released two. The, his first LP, um, which is an LP of Christmas music, we've released as a CD, and a compilation which we've called Music for the, called Music for the Church Year, uh, which is made up of tracks from some of his other recordings as well. And uh, from 1986 onwards, John Dunn, my predecessor, recorded four CDs, um, which all of these CDs, including the re-release, are available from our school website. Thanks for being with us, John, and here's how you can share in this liturgical treasure of Boston. joined by a distinguished group of Bostonian women who all have ties to the Latin Mass. Ladies, tell us a bit about yourselves and what you do here. Chrissy? Well, I'm a sophomore here at Harvard University and I've been a parishioner at St. Paul's for the past two years now. Um, I've been very involved with the Catholic Student Association and a few different Catholic groups on campus and I've been attending Latin Masses for a little over a year now. Luciana? I am a junior at Harvard studying government and I've been going to the Latin Mass for about two years now. I was dragged by a friend and I've been very happy to go ever since. And Mary? I'm a recent graduate of Oxford University, England, and I've been going to the Latin Mass since I arrived there about four years ago. Um, currently I am a high school tutor and I co-founded Juventude in Boston. Ladies, if you had a female friend that you were trying to encourage to go to the Extraordinary Form, what would you say to her? I would just tell her about how beautiful I find the experience and I would encourage her to come with me. I would invite her uh, to come along and check it out. I would uh, first tell them that I've been able to learn a lot more about the Mass itself um, in my experiences going to the Latin Mass and I would also encourage them to reflect on um, the history of the Mass and, and to think about that the Latin Mass is the Mass that their grandparents and their great-grandparents went to and to be able to experience that same liturgy and to have the opportunity to see that um, is, is very unique. So I would encourage them to, um, to want to partake in that. When I usually invite my friends to the Latin Mass, I sort of preface it with that it's a different experience and to be prepared for sort of quietness and mm -hmm. to embrace that, whether by following along the Missal or just to simply sit and watch because it is so beautiful. Sometimes they have beautiful gold vestments or just seeing the incense float through the air um, to sort of give them a general sense of the Mass. But just to say that it's a little bit different, but you'll see, you'll see the continuity, you'll see the similarities and it'll be really beautiful. At the Extraordinary Forum, you often see women with hair coverings, either a chapel veil or a mantilla. Why would one wear one, other than to cover a bad hair day? <laughs> From my own personal experience, it did take me about two years to get used to the idea of wearing a mantilla. Um, at first, I wasn't really sure what to make of it, and it felt a little bit too old-fashioned, even though I love tradition. Um, but one day I decided, well, maybe I should wear one. Um, and at first it was a bit awkward. I felt like people were looking at me and it was strange. But over time you really get used to it. And there's something beautiful about putting it and covering over your head with mantilla. And it feels like even, I know I'm humbling myself before the Lord, but also to have that peripheral vision almost blocked out. And I feel like all my eyes, um, my eyes are centered on Christ itself. And um, now I have a hard time going to Mass and not putting on a mantilla and not feeling that change from secular to sacred. What role might a woman have in organizing a Latin Mass other than attending the Mass? I think one important way to help in the organization of the Mass is to think about what we can do to prepare for the Mass. Um, and something that's very important, I think, is to have the rosary said. So it's nice to see the group of women, we get together and we say the rosary before. 
I think it's very important for the women to be present at the Latin Mass as well. The, um, the, the men have a great role in um, serving the Mass, but I think as you mentioned, participation is key. And I think that a lot of the time, um, simply inviting other women is a big part of um, bringing more women into the Mass. What opportunities exist for volunteering to promote the Latin Mass, either by promoting the Latin Mass on the internet or promoting the Latin Mass on campus with your fellow students, or just say at the door of the church if someone is passing and they don't know what they see inside? Um, it's very important to publicize the Latin Mass and let the student body, if you're on a college campus, uh, be aware that it's about to happen and it's coming up and send them reminders. So a great way to do that is to email. Email all your friends, email any lists that you're involved with. Um, and also publicizing through Facebook works very well, creating events on Facebook that people can join or accept. I think it's also very important for us to talk about it in our daily conversations. Um, after Mass on Sunday, when you go to dinner with your friends, talk about the Latin Mass and also try to clarify some of the misperceptions about it. A lot of people don't know that Latin Mass still exists. That is key. So talking about it um, you know, in your daily uh, experiences is very helpful. And also talking to the priest um, to talk about it as well, I think is important because of we see the priests as an authority, and they are. And I think it's very important for the laity to hear from the priests what's so special about the Latin Mass. So having our um, clergy talk about it in their homilies or in their interactions with people and them reach out as well is really important. Girls, is it hard to find a love interest that's as Catholic as you are? Well, um, I've been incredibly grateful for the way the Lord has blessed me. Um, I met my boyfriend a little over a year and a half ago at this point, and we actually met at daily mass. Um, and we got to know each other by attending a nightly rosary group together. Um, so I definitely feel that he encourages me to grow in my faith, and I certainly hope that I do the same for him and I couldn't be happier. I really couldn't. I think in today's day and age, it is hard to find a love interest anyway, just the way <laughs> the culture is going. But I think specifically, too, in the Catholic world, because there's, there's a quite a few groups, but they are still small groups, and a lot of people know each other. So to be able to date somebody, it's sort of made public within a small group, and if things don't work out, people ask questions. Um, so I do, I do think it's difficult, but when you think about it, it is God's will. So you just have to continue praying and hoping that he blesses you with someone special. My friends and I joke that a lot of the men that we would like to date, unfortunately, want to go to seminary. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> uh, I think it is difficult to find Catholic men who... Um, are very devout Catholics and that are not called to the priesthood. But I think that it's important to um, discuss the importance and the vocation of marriage. Um, it, it is a beautiful vocation and we see the benefits that it has for society and the um, you know, negative impacts that uh, failed marriages are having on our communities as well. So it's something we have to work on. I agree, it is difficult. Um but it's also possible. So they're out there, just keep looking. Thank you so much for being with us today, girls, and the very best with all your professional and personal endeavors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have you ever thought about what it takes to play a pipe organ proficiently? Compared to a piano, it's an amazingly complex instrument. It's an athletic endeavor, a multitasking miracle to play it well. Here at St. Paul's, we discovered an impressive young member of the boys' choir who is not only comfortable playing this instrument, but he's also an accomplished composer. And he's only 13. Hi, Forrest. Hello. When did you become interested in learning to play the pipe organ? Well, actually, um, when I was in the public school and in fourth grade, my music teacher was um, very interested the organ. He was actually an organist. And he sort of sparked my interest in the pipe organ. 
Um, sometimes I would have um, private sessions with him and he would play music by composers like Bach, written for the organ. And I was just amazed at the awe and wonder and the power of the instrument. And I guess that sort of sparked my interest in the organ. And did your parents ever have to make you practice? Well, yes, yes. Um, I practice um, not at home, since I don't have an organ there. <laughs> um, but at school, we have a small organ and at St. Paul's. And how many hours a day do you practice? Um, I try to get in at least one hour a day, um, up to two hours. And what inspires the music you compose? An image, a feeling? Both, I think. There can be many things that inspire uh, my compositions. Um, I'm especially inspired by nature. For example, I wrote a set of pieces for piano quartet, uh, piano, violin, viola, and cello, about clouds. Um, and I am currently writing a piece based on Dante's Inferno. What other pieces have you written? Um, I've written two piano sonatas, uh, the first of which is about the death of Abraham Lincoln, the second of which is about the journey for an imaginary horizon, which could be interpreted religiously or however one would like. And you also um, compose masses, music for a mass. What yes. does it mean to compose music for a mass? Well, an ordinary mass will have six movements, a Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, and Benedictus, and Agnus Dei, which are from the Latin mass. However, um, I have composed a Misa Brevis, which means a short mass, which only is composed of a Kyrie, a Gloria, a Sanctus, and an Agnus Dei. So that means no Credo. Um, which is very long, of course. And um, yes, I've composed it for a um, treble choir uh, in three parts, so that St. Paul's Choir can sing it. And how long did it take you to compose that mass? Um, several months, yes. What other instruments do you play? Um, well, besides the organ, I play the piano and harpsichord. Um, I also, unofficially, if you will, play the, um, the handbells and recorder at school. Okay. And what's your favorite instrument to play? That is a very hard question to answer. Sometimes I would think the piano, or sometimes I would think the organ. I think both of them are wonderful different ways. The piano is much more subjective to your touch, and the touch that you use on the piano can change the sound, whereas in the organ it's much more of an objective instrument, where you have to use the stops or pipes to meet your needs. For example, you can make a strong sound or a soft sound with the piano. But it's not just that. You can make the sound perhaps timid, if you will, or perhaps frightful. And I think that's the subjectivity of the piano because it's all controlled by your fingers. Whereas with the organ, you have some pipes at work and you have to, f and you have to figure out which pipes to use and which pipes not to use. So therefore, it's much more like you're reaching an objective point. And what would you like to be when you grow up? Oh, musician, of course. I'm probably a composer. Before you play for us, would you explain different parts of the organ? Oh, of course. Well, this is a very large organ, and this organ is very unusual in the fact that it has actually two main segments, if you will. Um, one is in the back of the church, and one is in front of the church, just a few feet above us right now. And also, we have many digital stops, but many real stops as well. The stops are these, these knobs, which you can pull out, which create different sounds. For example, if I were to pull out this stop, you get a sound such as that, or you could have a sound like that, or you could have different registers, etc. And there are several different types of sounds that you can achieve in the organ. I'm just going to explain a few of those now, which you can achieve on each of these manuals. The goal of these manuals is that you can have multiple sounds at once, for example, without having to use one of your hands. Now, the, now there's also a pedal board, which you can play, etc. And you also have these boxes here, which can make certain notes, but only certain notes, slightly louder or quieter. So for example, so that's an expressive device used for crescendo and decrescendo. Now, you have several types of different stops. You have reeds, which sound generally like this. This would be an oboe, or oboe in French, I believe. And then you also have um, flute stops, which slightly resemble a flute. And then you also have principles, which are the main characteristic organ sound. And you also have strings, which are some very 
nice sounding, if you will. <laughs> Forrest, would you honor us with one of your improvisations? Well, of course. Here with Father Michael Dre, pastor of St. Paul Parish and senior chaplain of the Harvard Catholic Student Center. Father Dre, welcome. Thank you. Could you give us a little history of St. Paul's Parish? Well, St. Paul's Parish has been in existence since the late 1800s, and uh, the reality is, is that the church that we're in today is not the original St. Paul's Church. The original St. Paul's Church is probably about three blocks down Mass Ave. Uh, right now stands one of the Harvard buildings, the Holyoke Center, which is a student resource building now. Uh, but in the early 1920s, uh, there was a great vision uh, to expand the parish and to build this magnificent church on this site. So this church was fi finished in 1924, and it's based on the outside architecturally on St. Zeno's in Verona, Italy. Inside is unique to St. Paul's. Uh, and as you can see, as you look around the church, it is definitely Domus Dei, the house of God. And uh, it really elevates and lifts the mind and the soul to the Lord uh, as, you, as you gaze upon the various symbols and the various uh, bits of architecture in this church that make it so beautiful. Uh, along the windows, we see the doctors of the church, with the exception of St. Ignatius. Ignatius got into the windows, and uh, I don't know how, but we're glad that he's there. And of course, our beautiful Lady Chapel with the statue of Our Lady of Victory drawing us to Jesus through Mary, which is such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful reality of our Catholic faith. So we're very blessed with a, a very beautiful church, again, that inspires and encourages people uh, to grow in a deep and abiding relationship with the Lord. The other big part of this parish, of course, is the choir school. Could you talk to us about how the choir school fits into the rest of the life of the parish? Well, the choir school, we are so blessed uh, with our choir school here at St. Paul's. The choir school was founded 50 years ago this year in 1963. Dr. Theodore Marier, who was a visionary uh, in his time, uh, recognized the call of the Holy Father to go forward and to promote, and not only promote and preserve, but to really strengthen uh, the lived experience of sacred music in the church, how that music contributes to and supports sacred liturgy, and thus helps people to engage their lives of faith with the Lord. And so for our young boys in grades four through eight, to be able to have the opportunity to study this music, to offer this music to the Lord, to be able to engage a very rigorous academic program infused by a very rigorous Catholic faith program as well, our catechetical program, and to be able, most importantly, on top of all of that, to be able to assist at Mass every day and to draw closer to Christ through that experience. What a gift that is to a middle school child. Do you find that there's any one demographic that the choir school ap appeals to more than any other? You see young and old. You see um, the very, very highly educated as well as uh, the very uh, humble uh, person as well. And there's a real mix because I think sacred music and the life of the liturgy, the prayer of the liturgy, touches the soul of everyone differently. So to say that it would appeal to one demographic uh, wouldn't necessarily be in concert with, uh, with uh, the, the spirit of the liturgy is either. Because you think that, uh, you hope, the hope of prayer, of course, is that the liturgy is going to touch the person. Thank you, Father Dre, and thank you for hosting us here this week at Extraordinary Faith. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you.
We're very fortunate to be filming the very first Latin Mass in the Tridentine form featuring the Boys Choir School to be held here at St. Paul's. In the wake of the terrible losses suffered during the Boston Marathon just 10 days prior, this Mass will be especially healing for a community in need of peace and stability. There's more information about every place we visit on our website, ExtraordinaryFaith.tv, where we also invite you to participate in questions and discussions on our forums. Thank you for being with us, and join us next time when we again look at the beauty of historic Catholicism and celebrate the people and places that demonstrate extraordinary faith. On our next episode, come with us to the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, where we'll stop by the Church Music Association of America's Sacred Music Conference. We'll meet the people behind the world-renowned music program at St. Agnes Church. A full orchestral mass is performed there 30 Sundays per year, while children in their parish school are immersed in sacred music as part of their curriculum. We'll visit one of the first churches to introduce the Tridentine Mass after the Vatican reauthorized it in 1984. And we'll take a tour of the magnificent Cathedral of St. Paul, a liturgical lesson in stone. Mark your calendar to join us next time on Extraordinary Faith.